Hello, good day. This is your teacher Daniel Paliparan 3 Senior High School. Today we discuss the human person as an embodied spirit. One of the most common themes in the introduction to philosophy of human person is a human person as an embodied spirit. But first we have to define here that embodied spirit is not directly clear to students who do not have a strong background and orientation in philosophy. So, what do we exactly mean by the embodied spirit? The first connotation that comes out in our mind that embodied is being materialized or incarnated. Embodied spirit as we say that it is a spirit being incarnated so therefore does not necessarily refer to the incarnation and materialization of spirit as an immaterial entity the concept of embodied spirit in christian philosophy states that the inseparable union of body and soul thus embodied spirit is the body is not separate from the soul, thus the soul is not separated from the body. We say that a human person and embodied spirit is the point of convergence between the material and spiritual entities of body and soul. We cannot talk, therefore, of a person without a body and soul. And we cannot talk of anything without the union of matter and form. Thus a person, an embodied spirit, is important because it enables us to know the potentialities and limitations. And it also exposes us to a thorough and deeper understanding of ourselves as a unique creature united by the body and soul. With this caveat in mind, let us now proceed to an engagement with one of the most fam famous philosophers in this particular scholarship, namely Aristotle. But we, before we proceed to the claim of Aristotle, of a human person as an embodied spirit, which is the embodiment of body and soul, it is important at this point to provide a theoretical context of this issue that Aristotle, as an embodied spirit of a human person, is a large part of the reaction against Plato's on the nature of human person. According to Plato, that the human person is seen in the physical dichotomy of body and soul. Thus, the body is material, therefore it is mutable and destructible. Thus, the soul is immaterial, therefore immutable and indestructible. In the dichotomy, it is says that there is an inherent contradiction between the body and soul. Since the body is material, mutable and destructible, and the soul is immaterial, immutable and indestructible, Plato contends in, this, in the context of nature of the human person, thus the body existence is dependent to the soul, and the soul's existence is independent to the body. In Timaeus, Plato argues that the soul existed prior to the body. Plato writes, the gods made the soul prior to the body and more venerable in birth and excellence to the body's mistress and governor. A. D. Babur claims the contention above made Plato conclude that the human is just a soul using a body. According to Plato, there are three parts of the soul, namely rational, spiritual, and affective. Plato says on the myth of the charioteer that 
to comprehend the complex nature of the soul. But we will not discuss it here because our purpose is to provide an overview on Plato's account on the human person that serves as the background on Aristotle's account on the human person as an embodied spirit. According to Plato, the rational soul is located on the head. The spiritual soul is located on the chest, while the petitive soul is located on the stomach. Plato says that a spiritual and a petitive soul is the motion and the activity of the whole person, while the rational soul is the guide or is to guide the spiritual and the affetative soul. According to Plato, the affetative soul drives the human person to experience thirst, hunger, and other physical wants, while the spiritual soul drives the human person to experience abomination, anger, and other emotional feelings, and the rational soul enables the human person to think, reflect, analyze, comprehend, draw conclusion, and the like. He says that the rational soul is the highest of all parts of the soul. It guides the other two parts, affetitive and spiritual. What else could perform this guiding function that Plato's point of view than the rational parts of the soul? Think of a desperately thirsty man in the desert. He sees a pool of water approaches it. With all the eagerness that deprivation is able to create, but when he reaches the pool, he sees a sign. Danger, do not drink, polluted. He expresses conflict within. His desire urges him to drink, but reason tells him that such sign usually indicated the truth, that polluted water will make him ill or may kill him, in that if he drinks, he will probably be worse off than he doesn't. He decides not to drink. In this case, it is the rational part of the soul that opposes his desire. His reason guides him away from the water. The principle drives the person to drink is the appetite, and the principle forbids the person to drink water because it is polluted is the reason. Another example could be that of a man who is angry with another person because he insulted him. Out of anger, he may desire to kill his mother, but he does not actually kill the whole thing because he knows that if he does, he will be in prison. With the same thread of reasoning, Plato argue, argues that the spirit in man that makes a person angry with his derider, yet his anger is curbed by reason, that is by rational soul. Again, for Plato, desire, spirit, reason, makes up the soul. Desire motivates, his spirit animates, Reason guides. For Plato, a prison can successfully guide desire and spirit. The person will attain the will balance personality. If we recall that Plato says that the soul exists prior to the body, hence that the soul is an entity distinct from the body, it is important to know that if we talk about the human person, we talk about the body and soul, and it is inseparable. But it is not the case for Plato, because Plato believes that the body and soul are separable. And according to Plato, that the human person is just a soul using the body. Plato's believe that the soul is imprisoned in the body and that the soul survived the death of the body, it is immaterial, immutable, indestructible. 
Plato believes that the body decomposes, therefore the soul leaves the body and goes back to world of forms. It must be noted that Plato's doctrine of forms has two kinds, namely the world of forms and the world of matter. According to Plato, everything comes from the world of forms and everything that exists will go back to the world of forms after it perishes. According to Plato, the body decomposes and the soul will go back to the world of forms and lives there eternally. It is in here that Aristotle's notion of the human person as an embodied spirit comes in. Indeed, that Aristotle disagree on Plato's notion of dualism that implies otherworldliness. Aristotle believed that there is no dichotomy between persons, body, and soul, that the body and soul are in the state of unity, therefore it is inseparable. According to Aristotle, we cannot talk about the souls apart from the body and vice versa. And so, how does Aristotle view the human person as an embodied spirit? First, we have to understand that the term soul is the English translation of the Greek word psyche. For Aristotle, the general definition of soul is the concept of life. And the soul for Aristotle is the principle of life. And it suggests that anything that has life has a soul. And the principle of life that the soul drives the body to live. And indeed, it animates the body. If the soul is the animator of the body, and the body is the matter of the soul, Aristotle believes that the soul is the form of the body, while the body is the matter of the soul. According to Aristotle, everything that exists is composed of matter and form. Therefore, it is inseparable. Hence, we cannot talk of anything if either of these entities is not present. In the context of human person, Aristotle believed that the body and soul are inseparable. That human person, therefore, considered as a whole. Because of Aristotle, anything that has life has a soul. And the plants and animals, in addition to humans, have soul. And Aristotle distinguishes that there are three levels of soul. That, that of plants, that of animals, and that of humans. And the soul present in the plants is called vegetative. And for animals and humans is sensitive and rational soul, respectively. Aristotle believes that plants have souls because they possess the three basic requirements for something we call living being. The capacity to grow, reproduce, and feel itself. However, plants do not share higher level of soul, but they have the capacity to grow, reproduce, and feed itself. Plants does not have the capacity of feeling and thinking, while sensitive soul has the capacity to grow, reproduce, and feed itself. Unlike vegetative, the sensitive soul has the capacity of sensation. Aristotle writes that plants possess only the nutritive faculty, but other beings possess both it and a sensitive faculty. And if they possess the sensitive faculty, they must also possess the appetitive or appetite consists of desire, anger, and will. All animals possess at least one sense, 
that of touch, anything that has a sense is acquainted with pleasure and pain, with what is pleasant and what is painful, in anything what is acquainted with this as desire, since desire is appetite for pleasant. Lastly, the rational soul has the capacity to grow, reproduce, feed, and feel. It has capable of thinking. Aristotle believes that the highest level of soul is present only in humans, since humans possess the characteristics of animals. They have the capacity to grow, reproduce, feed, and feel. According to Aristotle, the human person is just an animal that thinks. And Aristotle's famous dictum of a human person that a man is a rational animal. Thank you and God bless us all.